Amen. Amen. All right, we began here in the traditional chapter, the most popular chapter of the Christmas story. I want you to turn over to Matthew chapter number 2, though, because that's going to be our text. I definitely wanted to read that here as introduction. I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. Did all the kids have a good Christmas this morning? Amen. Yeah? Did all the men get enough socks and underwear to make it through 2020? Yeah? So Matthew chapter number 2 is where we're going to begin. That's going to be the text this evening. And the title of the sermon is Lessons Learned from the Wise Men. Lessons Learned from the Wise Men. Now, still in the introduction, I want to make a point real quick of, of why I believe that it is good to celebrate Christmas. Why I believe that it is good to celebrate Christmas. This is a holiday that receives a lot of resistance. And there's m new people and more people every year that are falling into this, this idea of, of, of just anti-Christmas and that Christmas is evil. Had a couple people, you know, write me recently. Now, of course, when I talk about Christmas and why it's good uh, you know, to celebrate Christmas, I'm talking about the aspects that are about Christ, the aspects that have to do with Christ. The reason why I believe that it's good to celebrate Christmas is because it is Christ-centered. The purpose of the holiday is to be Christ-centered. Right there, even in the name, what is the name of it? It is Christmas. Christmas. Christmas, of course, is what that is referring to. If you look around, you know, you see things that are related to uh, Christ all the time. What's one thing that you see all the time? A nativity scene, right? And one of the first things you would think of, a nativity scene. Even conceptually, when you look at the nativity scene, now, I'm not you know, advocating to set up a nativity scene. Of course, that's idolatry. But uh, when you look at you know, the nativity scene, when it's set up, you see all these different characters that are there. And yes, there are doctrinal errors with that as well. Don't pick apart every aspect of it. That's not what I'm focusing on. You see the shepherds. You see the wise men. You see Joseph. You see Mary. But do you know what you see also there? You see a baby in the manger. And do you know where the baby in the manger is located? Right in the middle. Right in the center. And what's everybody around doing? They're all looking at Jesus. And that kind of gives you, a, you know, conceptually an idea of what Christmas is about. It's meant to be, you know, uh, focused or centered on Christ. That is the purpose of Christmas, of course. It's a day that we set apart where we can celebrate the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you should read Luke chapter number 2. Maybe before you guys do some practices, some family traditions that you do. You should make sure that you emphasize the real reason for why we are celebrating Christmas and remind them that this is a time that we set apart and where we can reflect upon and where we can think about the birth of our Savior when God came to this earth to redeem us and came and was born as a man on this earth. And if you think about it, uh, you know, look, think about atheists, agnostics, people that are against Christ, against the Bible. Whether they like it or not, they end up thinking about Jesus a lot more during this season, a lot more around December 25th than they do the rest of the year. Why? Because you're just constantly bombarded with things. You know, they're constantly, you know, uh, hearing maybe Christmas songs that are, that are mentioning Jesus. They're saying over and over again, or they're hearing people say, Merry Christmas. And people will bring up, you know, the aspect that, Christmas is a, uh, you know, some people will even say that Christmas is a pagan holiday, but they'll, they'll attack maybe the Christmas tree, and they'll attack things like that. Now, um, obviously, you know, we don't celebrate Santa, you know, in our household. Uh, you know, I don't believe that it's right to lie to your child about, you know, and there's a lot of, uh, of evils that come with that as well, of, of how eerily he, he, he is uh, related to you know, a works-based salvation of being this guy in the sky, this guy up north, right, that sees everything that you do. And if you're good, if you're good, he's going to give you a gift. Obviously, that's in opposition to what the Bible teaches on the definition of how to receive a gift. A gift is, is something that's free, right? So, uh, you know, we don't celebrate that aspect of it, but, but Christmas trees in and of itself, there's nothing, I don't believe, evil with that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, people, well, that's one thing that people often try to attack and say, hey, this is, uh, you know, this, is, they'll go to, first they try to go to, you know, to Jeremiah chapter number 10. And when they turn to Jeremiah chapter number 10, you know, once you show to them, hey, that's idols, then they're just like, well, if you look in history, there's all these pagan cultures that like set up Christmas trees. The problem is there's no commandment in the Bible that tells you that you can't set up a Christmas tree. So that's, that, you know, you could, you could see things that pagans have done in all, you know how many pagan cultures have existed throughout history? Just because 1,300 years ago there was a, a pagan culture that set up a Christmas tree in the corner and put gifts under it, you know, maybe to their God or whatever it may be, that doesn't mean that there's anything inherently wrong with 
setting up a tree, decorating the house with a tree, decorating the tree, and then putting gifts under it. There's nothing sinful or wrong about that. So um, I want to go, I want you to turn, if you're not already there, to Matthew chapter number two. And I wanted to just begin there with why I believe that it's good to celebrate Christmas. You know, the, we shouldn't be fixated on the things of the tree. We shouldn't be fixated on the things of the gifts and all of that. What we should make sure that we do is that we keep our focus on Christ. And that's why I believe that there's a lot of good in Christmas. It's because the purpose of the holiday for us as Christians should be that it's Christ-centered. That the focus is on Christ. It should bring more attention to Christ. Now here in Matthew chapter number 2, Matthew chapter number 2, I want to read this passage quickly. I definitely didn't want to miss out on the opportunity to read Luke chapter number 2, which is the greatest record of the Christmas story. But here, Matthew chapter number 2, I want to read down through here the story of the wise men. And then I'm going to give you some lessons that you can learn from the wise men. Different things that we can learn from the wise men. Look here at Matthew chapter number 2, verse number 1. The Bible says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled. <clears throat> And all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the, the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel." Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring, him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed and lo... The star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with, Ma with Mary his mother, excuse me, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. The very first point that I want to begin with that we can learn, the, the lessons that we can learn from the wise men, is that Jesus is the King of Kings. Jesus is the King of Kings. Now I realize that the wise men are never referred to as kings. In spite of you know the title of the, of the song, We Three Kings, the wise men are never one time referred to as specifically being kings. But one thing that you can extract from the story and from these men is that they are men of authority. These are men that are of the up, upper class, or they are men that we would consider to be you know, rulers or some sort like that. Now, if you study the, the, the phrase wise men and you look at the characteristics of these types of men, that's what they end up being every time. One of the perfect and great examples is in the story of Daniel. If you look in the book of Daniel, you look at the wise men. Who are they? Well, even if we exclude uh, Daniel himself from the beginning, these are men that, that give counsel directly to the king. They're still men with authority. They're still men that would be considered a ruler. Look specifically at Daniel himself. Daniel was considered a wise man. And what position did Daniel himself have? Very similar unto Joseph, he was put as uh, being basically backup or second in charge to the king at that time. So a wise man is not someone of the lower class. A wise man is not someone you know that's a poplar or someone that's a very poor man. A wise man is a man that would be some sort of ruler or some sort of upper class. He's a man that has authority. And I want you to look with me at Matthew chapter number 2, verse number 1 and 2 at what these wise men were doing. It says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, 
Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Now watch this. For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. So in, even though these men were maybe used to receiving gifts themselves or maybe used to being bowed down to themselves or maybe used to being praised and glorified themselves, I want you to notice that when Jesus Christ was born, that when Jesus was born, that they went to worship him. That they even as being some sort of ruler or as being some sort of king, that they recognized that there was a king that was above them. That they recognized that there was a king of kings. Furthermore, that proves that they were men of authority. Not just anybody can just walk into a palace. Not just anybody can just say, hey, I want to speak to King Herod. I want to walk in and I want to speak to King Herod. Can anybody just march into the president's, you know, to the Oval Office and just sit down and start talking to Donald Trump? Of course not. Only people that have authority, only people that have power would be able to do so. Showing that these men were obviously that of upper class. They bring, they bring gifts of upper class, don't they? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These would be men that would be likened under the position or the office that Daniel had. They would be considered a ruler. right? Jesus is referred to as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. These would be men that in some sense were a Lord. These would be men that were in some sense a king. But when Jesus was born, when the Messiah had come, when the Savior was born, you know what they realized? I need to worship Him. Even though I have authority, He has far more authority. Even though people may, in a sense, praise me, He deserves my praise. I'll show you something even more interesting here, and I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Why do you think that the, that the wise men went to Herod? Why do you think that the wise men went to Herod? Well, where did Herod dwell, of course? He would dwell to kings dwell. He dwelled in some sort of palace, I'm sure. He dwelled, you know, where you would think that a king would be. So where would you go if you were looking for a king? You would go somewhere where it looks like, hey, this looks like where a king would dwell. I'm sure, why would they specifically go in and just seek out and look, you know, uh, 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 in the palace where King Herod is located? But something even more interesting than that is if you look at chapter number 2, verse number 1, it says this. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, now watch this, in the days of Herod, what? The king. So what position does Herod hold? What is he referred to as? He's referred to as the king. Herod is a king, isn't he? It says this, Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? So notice that they walk into the palace... They walk in and see Herod probably maybe sitting on a throne. He has his crown on. He maybe has, you know, as you'd see or, or picture or think, you know, women standing there or servants standing there. He's in his royal attire and they walk up to this king. They walk up to he that is a king. And what do they say? Where's the king? I want you to notice that they weren't interested in Herod. They weren't interested in speaking to this king. They weren't interested in seeing this king. They were interested in seeing the king of the Jews. Further proving that, they were looking for the king of kings. These men who were rulers, these men who were kings or lords themselves, they came and they even were going to worship and recognize the king of kings. They were going to give their praise to you know, the king of kings. Now, also, another thing that's really interesting is, is uh, uh, Herod himself, he recognizes this. Obviously, he knows what the Bible teaches about the king of the Jews. He knows what the Bible teaches about he who is going to raise up you know, amongst Israel. He's going to come of the seed of David, of the, of the line of Judah. That he's going to be the king of the earth. That he is going to be the king of kings. So, Herod gives lip service to the fact that he's going to worship him. I want you to look here in Matthew chapter number 2. I want you to look at verse number 8 at the very end, the very last statement. He says this, Bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. So what is he doing? He's giving lip service to the fact that, hey, I'm going to worship him also. Knowing what? Knowing that he is what? The king of kings. Knowing that what the Bible teaches, that this man is the prince of princes. He is the king of kings. Now, does Herod end up worshiping Jesus? No, what was he trying to do? He was just trying to find out who he was so he could do what? So he could kill him. So he could put him to death, right? Why? Because he was threatened by him. He was scared. He obviously knew that he had something to be scared about. Or why would he be, you know, why would he even be afraid to even, uh, you know, he would just leave him alone if he thought, hey, this guy isn't any threat. You know, he's the king of the Jews. So did Herod end up bowing to Jesus? Did Herod, Herod end up going and, and worshiping Jesus? If you read out the story and, and follow through the story, he didn't, did he? 
No, Herod didn't. You know, the wise men went and they were, you know, humble, of course. They were willing to go and they were willing to, you know, worship before Jesus, weren't they? Now, whether Herod did so in this life or, you know, didn't, he will one day. Because Jesus is the King of Kings. And you can go through a line and a list of every king that has ever existed. You can think of all the pharaohs. You can think of Napoleon. You can think of, you know, Alexander the Great. You know, every king, Henry the First, Second, Third, Fourth, everyone. It doesn't matter who it is. Every king, Herod, that ever existed. Do you know what they're going to do one day? They're going to bow before the king of kings. Every ruler and every lord and every man that has ever had any authority at the end of this life and at the end of their life and, and, and ultimately at the white throne judgment, we're all going to be standing there small and great. You know what you're going to know? Everybody's going to know when we leave. He's the king of kings. Because every ruler that has ever, ever lived will bow before Jesus Christ. Herod might not so in this life. He might not have worshipped in this life, but he will someday. He tried to kill him in this life, didn't he? But there will be one day when he recognizes he who was born king of the Jews as the king of kings and the lord of lords. One thing that we can learn from the wise men is that he's king of kings. These men that had authority, these men that, that were rulers, they even acknowledged it. And they said, you know what? I as a ruler, I'm going to worship him. He is my king. He's the king of Kings. The second thing that we can learn from them is their, is their sacrifice or is their oblation. I want you to look with me here at Matthew chapter number 2 verse number 11. Matthew chapter number 2 verse number 11 says this, And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and it says, And fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasure, treasures, they presented unto him gifts gold and frankincense and myrrh. I want you to notice that they gave sacrifices to him. They gave oblations, if you will. You know, a sacrifice is obviously when you give up something that, that is, is a possession or a good for you. It is beneficial for you, but you're willing to, to give it up <coughs> Excuse me for somebody else. Not only were they willing to sacrifice some of their goods and some of their you know, income, if you will, or possessions, they also, if you think about it, they sacrificed their time. They were willing to sacrifice a lot of time. Now, Herod did the math for you because Herod asked the wise men, how long ago was it that the star appeared? Right? And then, after he tells them, Herod makes a decree that he's going to kill all the children that could possibly be this child. And how long back does he go? Two years. These men, that's why uh, you know, the, the writer or the author of the song, We Three Kings, it says, We Three Kings of Orient are. Saying that these men traveled from you know, the area of Orient, which would be for sure referring to Asia. Do you know why that makes sense? Because it took two years to get there, roughly. Now, he might have been putting, and I've thought about this, he probably put a buffer there. Because if you want to make sure you kill this child, you might say, hey, you saw it. You know, a year and five months ago, well, let's just kill every child two years and old and older. Or, or younger, I'm sorry. Two years and younger. Any child that's been born that, you know, in the past two years, let's just make sure that we kill all of those children. But even still, a year and five months. A year and five months. They saw the star and immediately what did they do? They started traveling and following the star. Now, that is a sacrifice of your time. That is a major sacrifice of your time. Let's say that it is a, a full year and five months. Now, yeah, they may have done other things while on the trip. Of course, they're not just, you know, just, just traveling the entire time. I don't know what type of, 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 of situation that they had, and where they're stopping, and how long they stopped, where, or whatever it is. But a year and five months, a year and six months, you know, let's just say roughly two years. That is a long time. That is a big sacrifice. The biggest sacrifice that we can do for Jesus is what? It's to sacrifice our time. It's to sacrifice our lives. That's, that is the greatest sacrifice that we get. That's what he calls us to do is to be, the Bible says, a living sacrifice. The greatest thing that you have, the most important thing that you have is time. And the older you get, the more you realize how significant time is. When you look back at your life and you see all the wasted time in your life. When you see how old you are and you see of, you know, of, of all the things, the possibilities, the things maybe that you wanted to do. So they not only sacrifice their income, they not only sacrifice goods and things that were important to them, but they were also willing to sacrifice their time. This is a lesson unto us. We should be willing to sacrifice our goods. We should be willing to sacrifice, as Jesus says, land, houses, all of these things. But you know what else we should be willing to sacrifice? Our time. 
We should be willing to sacrifice our time, putting time aside to go and do things that are important for the Lord. Soul winning, you know, practicing the music, maybe doing work down here, things that are work for the Lord, praying. We should be willing to sacrifice Bible reading. All of this is time where you could be doing something maybe that benefits yourself, right? You could be doing something maybe that helps you further your career or further your job. But Jesus wants us to be a living sacrifice. These men were willing for two years. The, the entirety of this travel was pointing towards one thing. They had jobs, I'm sure. But they sacrificed their source of income. They most likely had families. You know what they were willing to do? Sacrifice that time with their families. They had, you know, uh, uh, you know, obviously the people and their friends, I'm sure, were the city where they were from. But they, you know they said? This is a long trip. It took them two years to get there. I'm sure it took about the equal amount of time to get back. Let's just use the maximum example. Four years of their life. Four years of their life. Full four years. They sacrificed to travel, to go, and to, and to worship and bow before Him. I don't know how long they spent there, but I doubt that it was an extreme amount of time. Maybe a week at the most. Two weeks. But they sacrificed four full years of their life. That's a lot of time. For the travel there, to worship Him and praise Him, give Him these gifts, and then back. You know why? Because He's worth it. That's a major sacrifice. Now, if you were to add up all the amount of time that you've been soul winning, that you've been reading your Bible, that you've been praying, how much time would it come to in your Christian life? Four years is a long time. The entirety of that time was all spent towards getting there just for Jesus. All of it. Of course, they brought gifts, that, but you know, the most important thing that you have, as I mentioned, is the time that you have. That's the most important thing to God. That's what He wants. It's for you to sacrifice your time for Him, to be a living sacrifice. So we learn the, the sacrifice. And why do people normally sacrifice? Normally because of gratefulness. You know, the Bible talks about repeatedly. You know, because we have received mercy, like it speaks of in Romans 12.1. You know, because of gratefulness. They're, they obviously know who they're coming to worship. They are, they're very, very, they're aware of it. I believe these are saved men, the way who they're coming to worship. They said, hey, we're coming to worship the King of the Jews. And we followed His star in the East. That they knew who they were coming to worship. They knew who the king of the Jews were. They were coming to worship the Messiah. They were coming to worship the Savior. These men were. Do you know why they would do that? Because of gratefulness. Because why? Because they were grateful that God fulfilled His promise. They were grateful that God is going to save them, that He finally showed up. You know, that's what the, the, the Christmas story you know, uh, uh, symbolizes, represents to us. You know, that's what it teaches to us is what? That God fulfills His promises. You know, He gave His promise all throughout history. He just kept repeating and repeating it. And you know what that is? It's, it's the hope finally being manifested. That's why it's the, you know, all of those promises, the Word being manifest. His promise coming true. And they were thankful that God remembered them. You know, like, uh, like um, I believe it's, uh, um, maybe it's, maybe it's um, um, Mary that's speaking. I believe it's Mary. Maybe it's Mary that's speaking, but she says, you know, that, that God hath visited His people. You know, she was thankful and she was grateful that God had visited His people. That's why the, the wise men went. Why? Because he was thankful that, that the Messiah had come, that God remembered them, and that He had visited His people. They were grateful. That should compel us to sacrifice for uh, the Lord, for Jesus. Go to look at Matthew chapter 2, 11. Another thing that I want to point out, a very quick point, is that we can learn the great humility from the wise men. Another lesson that we can learn is the great humility that the wise men had. Now, as I mentioned already, these men were men of you know, uh, stature in some sense, obviously. These were men that had authority. They were rulers. They were used to people praising them. Daniel had people bow down to him, didn't he, at one point? They were used to being praised, at least verbally. They were used to being men in authority, being highly respected. But I want you to notice at verse 11 something very interesting. It says this, And when they were come into the house... It says, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. So not only are these men of authority, men that are rulers, men that are you know, lords or kings themselves in some sense, but these men walk into a house with a child. I mean, I don't know if you've really pictured it, but it's an interesting illustration in your mind. These men, which appear as kings, they appear somewhat of royalty, I would assume. They walk into a house, maybe, and how old was Jesus at this time? He just gave the number to Herod, around what, two years old roughly. He's around two years old. So these men walk in, and you know what they do? They bow down before this baby. 
They bow down before a two-year-old. This, this two-year-old child is here with his mother. Maybe, I mean, you never know. It's possible that he's maybe, as I said, a year and eight months, a year and nine months. You know, uh, uh, maybe a little less than that. Maybe he's still even nursing. I mean, this is a baby. And these men come in and they bow down and they worship the Lord. They worship Jesus Christ. That takes great humility to worship this child. To worship, you know, it's of course God manifest in the flesh, but it still takes great humility. These men of authority, they even walked in and they recognized this. And it took great meekness and great humility in order to do so. The last point, and there's a couple of sub points with this. Point number four, we can learn from the feet of the wise men. We can learn from the feet of the wise men. One thing that the wise men are very well known for is their feet. And what do I mean by that? What does the song say? We traverse afar. As I mentioned already, this was a very long journey. This was a very long you know, uh, uh, um, you know, journey that they had taken. There was a lot of steps involved. There was a lot of walking. There was a lot of labor or work. And what, that's one thing if you ask people about, hey, you know, what do you know about the wise men? They would say probably from the song, you know, and, and like the Bible teaches, they traverse afar. They traveled a long way. So they were known for their feet. We as Christians also should be known for our feet. Look at Matthew chapter 2 verse 1. Matthew chapter number 2 verse number 1 it says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men, and then it says, from the east to Jerusalem. So they traveled a long way. They were known for their feet. We as Christians should also be known for our feet. Romans chapter number 10 verse number 15 says this, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. I was thinking about this more and more about how what a great picture the wise men are of soul winners and the lessons that you can learn from the wise men as a soul winner. Now, the first thing that struck me that's interesting, and this happens a few other times in the Bible, is that they must have left immediately. Right when they saw the star, they must have left right then and right there and started traveling. They didn't wait a long time. They didn't wait a while. What did they do? As soon as they received, and what is the star? What was the star representing? It's the birth of Jesus. And what is that referred to in Luke 2? It's, it's called glad tidings. It's the good news. So them, they, their selves, when they received the good news, what did they do? They immediately responded. They immediately responded to the good news and they went to go carry that good news to where? Where do we see them mentioned next? Standing there before Herod and doing what? Telling him the good news. Hey, the king of the Jews has been born. So the very first thing that they do after they receive the good news is they start walking. They start carrying the good news or going to convey the good news to someone else. And this is how a soul winner should be. This is how a person that gets saved should be. A person that gets saved, and this is something my pastor you know, told me that he wishes that, or that he, I'm sorry, that he did, and I told him that I wish that I would have done, is that I would have started serving God immediately right when I got saved. Because my pastor actually, right when he got saved, he started soul winning immediately. And that's one thing that I looked at his life and I said, I wish that I would have done that. I would have started serving God, number one, but I would have started soul winning immediately. And how much greater of a soul winner that I could be today because you're going to continually get to be a better soul winner as time goes on. You're always going to get, a, a, you know, learn new things and be able to deal with people more, right? So I wish that as soon as I got saved, that as soon as I was given or I was reconciled, that I could have taken the ministry of reconciliation or that key of the kingdom and given it to other people. And there's another example of this in the Bible, and that is the, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, because if you remember, you know, he's preaching the gospel unto her. You know, uh, he, they're talking back and forth and conversing. And once she realizes he's the Messiah, there's a point where it says that she leaves her water pot. And what does she do? It says that she goes into the city. And what does she say? Come see a man that told me all things that ever I did. She says, is not this the Christ? So immediately, what did she go do? As soon as she received the good news and she understood the good news, she went to go share it with somebody else. And that's how we should be. As soon as we receive the good news and we understand how great a news that it is, that the king is born, that the king died for us, was buried and rose again, and he did everything that we needed him to do to get to heaven, we should be excited by that good news and we should go carry that good news as far as we possibly can. 
to the ends of the earth if we need to. And if we need to travel from the east to the west, that's how important it is. That's what we should do. That's one of the first things that we can learn from the wise men in the aspect of soul winning. We can see that, hey, if you're saved, start soul winning today. Don't wait to go soul winning later. Start telling other people about the good news that you received. You have that good news. You saw the star in the east. Well, you need to start getting on your feet and traveling around and, and preaching that good news to other people as well. Point number two is also we can learn not to give up on soul winning. So if you think about this, who's the first person that they, that they tell the good news to? It's Herod. If you look at chapter number two, verse number two there again, it says, no, I'm sorry, yeah, verse number two, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. So Herod's the first person that he tells about this good news. Hey, this is the glad tidings. Jesus is born. Does he give a positive or negative reaction? Is it positive or negative? be negative, wouldn't it? It's pretty negative. He kind of, they kind of get blown off. Hey, he's not here. What do they do? Do they just give up? They don't give up. You know, after this, of course, God blesses them because they continue, and then they see the star in the east again. Right? So I want you to notice that they didn't just give up. They didn't just go home. Hey, let's just go home just because we, you know, there, it wasn't receptive here. You know, you shouldn't be surprised, I guess, if you're soul winning in a rich area and you're knocking on the palace door, right? You know, so they're going around... And they're soul winning, they're telling the good news, but the very first door they knock on, one of the people that they speak to is not very receptive. But you notice that they didn't give up. They kept going. They kept going until they found someone that was receptive or they, they found somebody that would invite them in. Isn't that true? Then don't, they, don't they get invited in and they get to go into the house? So they didn't give up after they told the good news to Herod and he wasn't very receptive. They kept going, and God blessed them, and they saw the star in the east. And it led them to where they needed to go. It led them to a house where they were invited in. So that's how we as soul winners should be. Sometimes, and, and here's the thing too, you know, one of the, 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 I'm sure one of the reasons of the discouragement later is, lately is because December has not been a receptive soul winning month. I don't know if you noticed that, but we have been soul winning just as much, and the numbers in, in November were way higher than the numbers in December. Like, literally four times as high. I went back and looked at it. December has not been super receptive for whatever reason. The soul winning on Sundays hasn't been super receptive. The soul winning on Mondays, even, even when we're soul winning in a, a, what we, we would think to be a super receptive area, hasn't been that receptive. Has anybody else noticed that? I would expect it to be way receptive if I'd have looked at that area beforehand. We're probably going to get like two, three people saved, you know, each night, each person. But that's not how it's been. It's been kind of unreceptive on Mondays, Sundays, you know, Saturdays, of course, because we knock around here. It's kind of been unreceptive. But you know what you need to do? You need to keep knocking. You need to keep knocking the doors and keep looking for the house that's going to invite you in. Keep looking for the person that maybe the stars brought over their house and maybe their grandma's praying for them and they're actually a receptive person because God will lead you there. God will give those people an opportunity and God will guide you and lead you to those people that are interested that will end up inviting you in. The, the three kings, or the three wise men, goodness sakes, I'm preaching heresy up here. They aren't interested. They, they, uh, uh, when they went to Herod, they weren't, he wasn't interested. But they didn't give up. They kept going and they found somebody who was. They found somebody who invited them in. They found somebody who invited them in. Not only that, I want to build the third point. This is the last point. We're going to be done here in about five minutes. I want to build upon that first lesson. How they were known for their feet. They were known for their feet because of the wise men. I want you to think about this. All of Jerusalem heard the gospel. Because of the wise men, all of Jerusalem heard heard the gospel. I don't know if you've noticed this before, but look at chapter number 2. Look at verse number 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Verse 2, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Now look at verse number 3. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. So notice that when he brings the, the good news of the king being born, Herod hears about it, and you know, uh, and as a result of that, where does this news end up being spread? All throughout Jerusalem. It says, and all Jerusalem with him. So every person in Jerusalem had heard at that time that these wise men came from the east and they brought a message. 
Or they brought this good news that the king of the Jews is born. Now, would a Jew at that time who studied in the Old Testament scriptures, would they know what that meant? Of course, they'd know who that's referring to. That's referring to the son of David. That's referring to the Messiah. He was coming to save us. The Bible says that all Jerusalem heard about it. All of Jerusalem. Now, I want you to think about that for a little while. This star occurred in the east while these wise men are there. Maybe there's three. We don't know. It doesn't tell you exactly if there's three, right? Maybe there's only three men. But these three men are the ones that receive this message, of course, through the star. Maybe they saw a prophecy as well. or Maybe they just, I don't know what they actually, to its full extent, knew and how they knew about this. But they came, just these possibly three men, came to Herod. Traveled all the way from the east to the west to bring the message that the king of the Jews is born. To bring the message, this is the gospel. When it's preached in Luke 2, it's referred to as glad tidings. It is the gospel that the king has come, that the Lord has been born. It is the gospel. And as a result of these three men, it says that all of Jerusalem, all of Jerusalem heard the gospel. Every person in Jerusalem. It says that they're troubled, of course, but it says that everyone in Jerusalem heard the gospel. And this is the point that I want to make. If, if all of our Jerusalem... All of Jacksonville is going to hear the gospel. There's going to have to be a lot of walking in, uh, you know, uh, involved. There's going to have to be a lot of steps involved. It's not going to be just a little bit of work. It's not going to happen overnight. If you are going to want to bring the gospel and preach the gospel to all of Jacksonville, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to happen over many years, especially if the church doesn't grow fast. If the, if the church stays smaller, the goal is still the same. Everybody in the brown, is gonna, that's going to all be colored in red. But, and if you were to look back at the moment when all of it's red, and you were to trace every last step that was taken through every single neighborhood and every subdivision, down every rural, rural road, up at, you know, every highway and hedge, do you know what there's going to be? A lot of steps involved. Amen. A lot of steps involved. That's what there's going to be. It's going to be a lot of walking. You know what that is? It's a lot of hard work. If you want to bring the gospel to all of Jerusalem, if you want to bring the gospel all the way from the east to the west and every single person gets to hear the gospel, you need to understand that it's a lot of work and it's not going to happen overnight. This took two years for them to get all the way here, didn't it? And then he spread it. You know, he, They preached the gospel to Herod. And then, by proxy, all of Jerusalem ended up getting the gospel. Because of why? Because of three men. Just because of possibly only three men. Now, our church is still you know, uh, in a very, very early stage. We're still a pretty small church. But that doesn't mean that we can't make a big impact. That doesn't mean that we can't have a huge impact. If you were to compare the amount of soul winning that we are doing to the average Baptist church in Jacksonville... I mean, goodness sakes, do you realize how much more soul winning that would be? I mean, the average church doesn't even go soul winning. My church that I grew up in was literally like one of the only five soul winning uh, uh, churches in the northern Kentucky area. And there's like 50 you know, independent Baptist churches in the northern Kentucky area. And it was like one of like five. And of course, when you grow up in an area your whole life, you know all the details about it. It was like one of five. And... and all the other churches, half of them went like once a month. They, go, they had like one time a month, you know, that they would go or for an hour, two hours. You know, the amount of soul winning that we're doing is, is a good amount of soul winning. But here's the thing. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take a long time. But even still, if we stay a small church, we can make a big impact. Just like these three men brought the gospel by proxy to all of Jerusalem, our church, even if it stays small, even being small, we can make a huge impact. Amen. But you know what it's going to take? A lot of work. Right. It's going to take a lot of steps. It's not going to happen overnight. It's gonna be, there's going to be a lot of footwork. We're going to have to, as a church, be known by our feet. So there's different points that we can learn you know, from the wise men. There are all these different points. We can learn great meekness from the wise men. They went before a baby. And they bowed down, them themselves as being kings, bowed down and worshipped a baby. They, they understood that he's worthy of sacrifice. You need to understand that Jesus is wor worthy of sacrifice. They, they also, what were they known for? They were known for their feet. 
We as Christians, we need to be known for our feet. Another thing that they recognized, that Jesus was the King of Kings. That Jesus was the King of Kings. You know, there are a lot of different lessons that we can learn from the wise men. There's a lot of great lessons that we can learn from the Christmas story in and of itself. And don't allow people to poison you against Christmas. There's nothing wrong with Christmas. Obviously, you know, as I mentioned, you know, the, the, you know Santa Claus is a lie. You know, uh, uh, just allow, you never, you, you know, you could spoil, if you just allow an independent Baptist child just to speak to like some worldly kid for like two minutes, you know, especially during Christmas time, it's never good. You know, uh, we were at, uh, when we were in Thanksgiving, uh, or in Northern Kentucky during Thanksgiving, we were in like this little sweet shop, and, and we walk outside, and I don't have a clue what's going on, but all of our kids are walking by. There's this huge line of kids. I'm talking how many? 20 kids probably? 30 kids? Huge line of kids waiting to see Santa. And, and I don't know who said it. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was Uriah. It was Uriah. Brother Simon's son. But we're walking by and he just yells like to the whole crowd. Santa's not real. Like the whole crowd standing there. And Santa Claus yells back like, yes I am. I'm right here. Or something like that. But yeah. So all you got to do is let an independent Baptist kid talk to your kid, you know, for five minutes and he'll end up, end up exposing the lie of Santa Claus pretty quickly. Uh, but hey, don't allow people to poison you against Christmas. There's a lot of good things that we can learn from Christmas. But do you know what we need to do? We need to, just as the wise men did, we need to keep the focus on Jesus. He needs to be the center of Christmas. We need to not allow all these other things, the distractions, maybe the bad things. Like I said, Santa Claus. You know, you know don't allow those to, to creep in. And maybe some of the stuff that's not necessarily sinful, it's not condemned in the Bible. Like, you know, the, Christ, uh, the Christmas tree, the gifts. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't allow that to become the purpose of Christmas. Make sure your kids know, hey, we're not doing this for the gifts. We're not doing this for the Christmas tree. We're not doing this just because it's a fun time of the year. Make sure they know that, hey, the purpose of this is to, is to worship the Lord Jesus Christ and to remember His sacrifice that He made for us. Amen. You know, He stepped down from glory. He stepped down from glory and became a baby for you and me. For you and me. I did that reverse. From you and me, right? He, you know, He stepped down. He, he gave up. You know, He's the King of kings. He's in heaven. And He loves us so much that He was willing to step down in this sinful earth for us. That's what we need to re you know, remember. And because he did so, just like the wise men, they understood, hey, he sacrificed for me. I need to do some sacrifice for him. Be known for your feet. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for your sacrifice. We thank you for everything that you've done for us, dear Lord. We thank you for the great example of the wise men. We ask you that you would bless this night, bless the fellowship, bless the time that we spend together. You know, keep us all safe, dear Lord God. Help us to have great unity as a church. Uh, help us to be a, a church that's known for their feet, dear Lord. Uh, help us not to take uh, uh, you know, uh, any of the attention off of Christ. Help us to keep you know, the attention on Christ all year round, uh, uh, dear Lord God, and, and to worship you and serve you and to, and to give you all the honor that you deserve, dear Lord. And bless all the families that are here, dear God. We love you so much and be with us. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.